Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest gospel, as you probably know, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. And we're here ready to come almost to the end of it. This is lesson number 12 in the book of Mark and it's entitled Tried and Crucified. So you can guess we're coming down close to the end of the gospel story. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to be able to review once again and relearn perhaps some of these points that are so important for our understanding of you and, and all that you have done for our salvation. I didn't direct in our discussion that things may go according to your will as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, in this lesson, we will discuss Jesus' interaction with the Sanhedrin from the end of Mark 14. You, of course, know that the Sanhedrin was a ruling body within the Jewish, you know, organization. They were controlled, of course, by the Romans, but, and they had a room that was right in the temple complex where they met 71 men high priest plus 70 others then we will discuss mark 15 with his trial in front of pilate his crucifixion and his burial in the big picture why did jesus have to die why was all of this necessary was it to pay the price for our sins as often as taught or was it something bigger much bigger something for the entire universe to see and learn. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, Mark 15 is the heart of the Passion narrative. It presents the trial of Jesus, his condemnation, the mockery by the soldiers, his crucifixion, and then his death and burial. Even in this chapter... The are, events. Excuse me, the events in this chapter are presented in stark, crisp detail, likely because the author lets the facts speak for themselves. Okay, that's, this would be Mark writing on behalf of Peter. This is Peter's gospel, okay? Throughout this chapter, irony plays an important role. Because of this, it is helpful to have a clear definition of what irony is. Irony often contains three components. Two levels of meaning, the two levels are in conflict or in contrast to each other, and someone does not see, mi see irony and does not recognize what is happening and does not know that he or she is the one who will suffer the consequences. This yeah. week, from the question of Pilate, are you the king of the Jews, to the mocking soldiers, the sign above the cross and the mocking of the religious leaders, he saved others himself he cannot save. To the unexpected appearance of Joseph of Arimathea, the chapter is filled with painful ironies that nevertheless reveal powerful truths about the death of Jesus and what its meaning is. Okay. The Bible study guide. We know who Jesus was. We know that. We know where he came from. One of my favorite stories, and some of you have heard this many times, is the black pastor in the South talking about the time when Jesus was 12 years old and he went there and, you know, he was being created by this same Sanhedrin we're going to talk about. And they were asking him questions. Well, he started off asking them questions and they turned around and asked him questions. And according to this black pastor, one of these gentlemen asked Jesus, how old are you, son? And Jesus hesitated for a moment. Then he said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that story. But now, the, the evidence we have for that is many places, but John 1, 1 to 3. Larry, you want to take okay. that for us? So John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. That's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? Are we talking about stars and moons and everything as well as all the stuff on this earth? 
Sounds like it, doesn't it? Absolutely. As we have noted in previous lessons, many times Jesus told people whom he had healed not to mention what he had done for them. That is sometimes called his revelation slash secrecy motif. But at this point in time near his death, it was important for Jesus to be seen and heard by as many people as possible, raising as many questions as possible about who he really was and why he was dying. The Sanhedrin played an important role in the final days of leading up to Jesus' death. And this is what one commentator says about uh, the Sanhedrin. Mona? The Sanhedrin located in Jerusalem was the Supreme Judicial Council of Judaism with 71 members. It figures prominently in the passion narratives of the Gospels as the body that tried Jesus and it appears again in Acts as the judicial court that investigated and persecuted the growing Christian church. Okay, so we, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that uh, they're into all kinds of stuff when it comes to trying to suppress the growth of the Christian church. A careful reading and understanding of the New Testament, including Acts 23, 1 and 6. Let's look at that for just a moment. Paul looked straight at the council and said, My fellow Israelites, my conscience is perfectly clear about the way in which I have lived before God to this very day. And this is talking about when Paul is being brought before the council lot, many years later. And then he said, When Paul saw that some of the group were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he called out on the council, Fellow Israelites, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and I am on trial here because of the hope I have that the dead will rise to life. And, you know, those are fighting words. <laughs> those are fighting words because the Sadducees absolutely didn't agree with any of that. These helps us to understand the an animosity. He was a former member of the Sanhedrin. Yes, he was a former member of the Sanhedrin. He was an, like an ex-senator in front of the Senate. And yeah. So he knew the background. Yes, absolutely, absolutely yeah. Uh, that the, the animosity that existed between Jesus and even between members of the Sanhedrin. They couldn't, ever, couldn't even agree among themselves. The one probably overwhelming message of this section of Scripture is how envious and hateful the Jewish leaders were toward Jesus. When, Jesus, when Judas offered to betray Jesus, they were delighted. After his arrest, when the high priest questioned Jesus directly as to whether or not he was the son of the Blessed One, Jesus answered, I am. They felt that was sufficient reason for condemning him for blasphemy. However, they needed the claim of sedition against Caesar to bring a charge against Jesus and make it stick in front of the Roman government, which had the authority, the only authority, to put someone to death, especially Jesus in this case. After Herod the Great died, the area of Judea came under the jurisdiction of his son Archelaus. Archelaus was so evil that the Jews demanded that he be removed, and at that point, the Roman government chose to place a Roman leader over Judea. That is why Pilate, not a Jew, but a Roman, was the leader of the Jews at the time of Jesus' ministry. While we know very little about Pontius Pilate, we do know that he was the governor of Judea under the Roman government from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. And Jesus' ministry were between what years? 31 and 33. 20. 34. Back up a little bit. 27 and 31. 27 and 31, yeah. good. He was known for doing many cruel things. This is, we're now talking about Pilate. Okay, Gordon. Luke 13, 1. At that time, some people were there who told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices to God from the Good News Bible. In their rage against Jesus, the Jewish religious leaders needed to find a rationale that would stand up before a pilot to whom they took Jesus for trial. Myra? The Bible study guide says the peer, I want to say that word. Procurators. Anyway. Oh, I wasn't going to say it right. Okay. Procurators, mm -hmm. such as Pontius Pilate or Felix, depended on Jewish courts or councils to handle many administrative matters. Okay, so that's from a recognized source, but so why do you suppose they were handling they were handing this kind of authority to the Jewish council, etc.? They didn't want to do it themselves. I mean, otherwise it would be just loaded with all kinds of stuff that 
you guys take all, care of all the small stuff and any, anything that's too complicated, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. If we could see those events in 3D color, 3D living color, and we will someday, this will be center stage in the panorama that we will see at the third coming. It'll be interesting to see how that will actually happen. You know, how yeah. can we see history? Exactly. What kind of screen? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to fill the sky probably. We would realize that the religious leaders were followed by a large crowd of Jewish rabble. Pilate recognized very quickly that the Jewish leaders believed that Jesus was a threat to them. They were envious of him. So when Pilate was trying Jesus, he turned to the crowd and asked how they felt. He did not realize that the crowd was already controlled by the Jewish leaders. When Jesus was brought before him, Pilate had hoped to get the crowd to stand up for Jesus and oppose the religious leaders. But instead, they just shouted back, crucify him. And our Bible study guide adds, ironically, it is Pilate, not the Jewish leaders, who alludes several times to God's kingdom and his identification of Jesus as the king of the Jews. So now, who is supposed to know about the king of the Jews? The Jewish leaders. The, leader. the Jewish leaders. Who, who keeps talking about the king of the Jews? Pilate. Pilate. This is part of our irony. Jesus brought the possibility of the kingdom of God to his nation. But the, uh, the invitation was rejected by the leaders of the nation. The secular government recognized Jesus as king, and Jesus permitted himself to be called such. From Pilate's perspective, Jesus died as the king of the Jews. According to the Gospel of John, quote, Pilate also wrote an insp inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. But Pilate didn't say this with respect. He said this kind of with mockery. Because yeah. they are a conquered people, mm -hmm. and they don't have a king, and if they do, this is what happens. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Thank you, Lorna. Good. Jim? The irony is that Jesus is both the Messiah and the King of the Jews. His convictions for blasphemy and sedition were mistaken. He should have received homage and worship instead. Yet, Jesus still acts in a kingly manner. His response to Pilate, you have said so, Mark 12, excuse me, Mark 11, 5, 2 of the ESV, is non-committal. He does not deny the title or affirm it. This response may suggest that he is a king, but of a different sort, compared to John 18, 33 to 38 from the yeah. Bible study guide. And one of the problems of studying Mark is, well, study any single gospel is that you always are thinking, okay, this is what it says over here, and this is what it says over here. And it's, so I like to study the story of Christ chronologically and then bring all the different parts in. The, 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 I think they, they fit together better when yeah. you do it that way. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Larry. Uh, the Bible study guide. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, Jesus says to Pilate, I am not only the king of the Jews, but I am also above all powers and kingdoms on the earth, including yours. <laughs> the import of these electrifying words seared Pilate's mind so that he made efforts to release him. That came from John 19, verse 12. Yeah. However, Pilate's understanding of the kingdom of God was limited by his view that there was no king higher than Caesar. And that's from John 19, 12, which of course was a title for the Roman emperor. Oh yes, okay. Now we're talking real power here, we're aren't we? Real Caesar. Pilate almost had been persuaded to release Jesus from the, non, from, from the condemnation of crucifixion. However, the people shouted, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Oh boy. Now we got a problem, don't we? Okay, Lorna? Pilate longed to deliver Jesus, but he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his own position and honor. Rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many to escape loss or suffering in like manner sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one way and self-interest points another. The current swep sets strongly in the wrong direction, and he who compromises with evil 
is swept away into the thick darkness of guilt. Okay, Gordon, you go on and have to pick it up there. Continuing from Desire of Ages, Pilate yielded to the demands of the mob. Rather than risk losing his position, he delivered Jesus up to be crucified. But in spite of his precautions, the very thing he dreaded afterward came upon him. His honors were stripped from him. He was cast down from his office and stung by remorse and wounded pride. Not long after the crucifixion, he ended his own life. So all who compromise with sin will gain only sorrow and ruin. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Okay. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, 738. Yeah. How often are we controlled by the, contra by the crowd or by peer pressure? When, someone, when I read about peer pressure, I think about a lady who used to live here in Loma Linda at the, at the villa. She was 104, and they asked her, well, what, what's special about being 104? She says, well, there's no peer pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like the quotes from a book called Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. People go mad rapidly in crowds, but re return to their senses slowly, one by one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. A good saying. Okay. I didn't make it up. <laughs> Is the, the fact that he died slow, um, shortly after the crucifixion a vision she had, or was it in the Bible? No, that's, that, that's documented as far as... Yeah, in the His records. Timing of yeah. When he died. Extra biblical sources. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was a Roman official, so man, we got to know about that. I just looked up with the definition of procurator. It says he, somebody that takes care of the financial affairs of, of a sovereign. Yeah. So, you know, he, just, he was a, a clerk, like a clerk. Yeah, well, <laughs> like he, he, had, he had life and death over, over yeah. the subjects. <laughs> Pilate's first attempt to release Jesus was to suggest that he should be set free. I find, remember, I find, no, I find no fault in him, but the people demanded Barabbas. What principles or factors mold and motivate our thoughts and decisions in life today? We could, we could be discussing that all the rest of the night, couldn't we? Yeah, I mean, it's heredity and it's, you know, DNA and it's all kinds of factors. And part of the reason, that, I mean, think of all the factors that divide our country these days. So Pilate suggested that he would have Jesus whipped and then released to them. But the people demanded that he be crucified. You know, Pilate historically was not a good man. No. He had not done good things. He had not been kind. No. And no, here no. he is now showing kindness. Yeah. That he understands this is not fair and he's trying to mm -hmm. be fair. It's astonishing, really. Some speculation that his wife was not too bad of a person. Yeah. She had a vision. Remember, she said, have, you know, don't have anything to do with this just man. And he was surprised by the choice of the people. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah he, he didn't expect that the, the crowd was going to be why on the they side. Choose Barabbas? Yeah. The whipping that Pilate suggested in place of, cru of crucifixion was a severe one. Myra? Bible study guide says, the Romans utilized a severe form of beating to prepare prisoners for execution. The victim was stripped of his clothes, tied to a pole, and then lashed with leather whips to which pieces of bone, glass, stones, and nails were tied. Can you imagine? No. After Jesus was whipped, the soldiers tasked with the execution continued his humiliation of, by clothing him in a purple robe, placing a cr crown of thorns on his head, and mocking him as king of the Jews. So here's another group saying, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. Yeah, mocking. <laughs> yeah. The group of soldiers is called a battalion. In this case, anywhere from 200 to 600 men. The irony in the scene is evident to the reader because Jesus really is the king. And the mocking words of the soldiers pro proclaim the truth. The action of the soldiers is a parody to how soldiers hailed the Roman emperor with the words, Hail Caesar, emperor. Thus, there was an implicit comparison to the emperor. Wow. Once Pilate agreed with the mob to have Jesus killed instead of whipped, Jesus was sent to Golgotha to be crucified on the cross. 
While the Romans loved to humiliate anyone who was to be crucified, the Jews abhorred public nakedness. So after beating him, mocking him, and placing the crown of thorns on his head, the Roman soldiers returned his own garments to him before the trek to the cross. I mean, and that, that garment must have been soaked in blood. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer. Mark 15, verse 21. On the way to Golgotha, they met a man named Simon, who was coming into the city from the country, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was from Cyrene and was the father of Alexander and Rufus from the Good News. Okay, Bible. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Where's Cyrene? Libya. Today it's a part of Libya. Yeah, imagine. Mm -hmm. A Christian, well, father of a couple of Christian, early Christians coming, coming from Libya. At this point in the Passover narrative, Jesus is a silent victim controlled by people who are bent on his death. Throughout the gospel, up to his arrest, he was the master of activities. Now he is acted upon, though he was a robust itinerant preacher, the beating he had received and the lack of food and sleep wore him down to where a stranger had to bear his cross, from our Bible study guide. When they arrived at Golgotha, Jesus was nailed to the cross and the soldiers gambled for his clothes. Okay, Jim. Mark 15, verses 22 to 24. They took Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they tried to give him wine mixed with a drug called myrrh, but Jesus would not drink it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes among themselves, throwing the dice to see who would get which piece of clothing from the Good News Bible. Okay, Larry, you want to pick up there with the Bible study guide? Okay. At the cross, his garments were removed, and he became the property of the soldiers who cast lots to see whose they would be and that's compared that, to Psalms 22, 18. Yeah, it was actually so there's a little, prophesied, just, little difference. Actually prophesied back in Psalm. Yeah. Crucifixion was a fairly bloodless method of execution. The nails used to fasten a person to the cross compared to John 20, for uh, 20, verse 20, chapter 20, verses 24 to 29, were likely driven through the wrist, not the palm of the hand, uh, below the palm where the no major blessed vessels run. In both the Hebrew and the Greek, the word for hand can refer to both the hand and the forearm, so it is much more broad than we think. Yeah. Uh, the palm of the hand itself does not have the structures necessary to carry the weight of a body in crucifixion. The median nerve runs through the center of the forearm and would be crushed by these nails, causing excruciating pain up the arm. Breathing was difficult. To get a good breath, the victim of crucifixion had to push against their nailed feet and flex their arms, again causing agonizing pain. Exhaustion, asphyxia, was one of the possible causes of this kind of a death. Wow, from our Bible study guide. Notice that even the Roman soldiers who are mocking Jesus called him a king. He was, in fact, not only king of the Jews, but also the king of the Romans as well. Okay, Lorna. Mark 15, 25 to 32. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the accusation against him said, <clears throat> the king of the Jews. They also crucified two bandits with Jesus, one on his right and the other on his left. People passing by shook their heads and hurled insults at Jesus. Aha, you are going to tear down the temple and build it up again in three days. Now come down from the cross and save yourself. Let me interrupt for a second. What does that imply? This is, they were being crucified right close to one of the closest, one of the main thoroughfares going in and out of uh, ancient Jerusalem. And that means that, I mean, that means that people on, just walking down the street knew the story, the story of Jesus. Ah, yeah. of, see? Okay, go ahead. In, In the, the same, same way, way mm -hmm. the chief priests and the teachers of the law jeered at Jesus, saying to each other, he saved, healed, and rescued others, but he cannot save himself. 
Let us see the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. And the two who were crucified with Jesus insulted him also. So more people are calling him King of the Jews and Messiah. From the Bible study guide, <laughs> one of their mocking statements stands out. In Mark 15, 31, they say, quote, he saved others, he cannot save himself. To make their point about his helplessness on the cross, they indicate that he did help others. And uh, the Greek verb can mean save, heal, or rescue. Thus, ironically, they admit he is the savior. The irony goes further. The reason he could not or would not save himself was because at the cross he was saving others. <laughs> wow. So, while on the cross, the Father was distancing himself from Jesus. How does that, can I ask that? It says, at the cross, he was saving others. How did that work? Is that really how that, he is saved that, us? Somebody ma made that up? Where well, can you find yeah. a, qu a quotation, a biblical quotation that supports that position? Well, you, you won't. You can That's put some things together. <clears throat> so, while on the cross, the Father was distancing himself from Jesus demonstrating for the universe what, what the separation of the sinner from God at the end will be like. Okay, that's... That is the final death. Yep. Yes, it's okay. From Desire of Ages. All his life, Christ had been publishing to the fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme, supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second, Myra. How did Jesus feel the withdrawal of his father's presence? He felt isolated, I think. Yeah. What you think? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm sure. What, what, what does that mean? I mean, what what he's what is saying here is that sin is the, the the father and the son have agreed that they they're going to demonstrate the consequences of sin by separating the two of them. And Jesus is going to die as a result of that separation. So um, all of us... They've never be been separated. Huh? They've never been separated. No. And we not. haven't either. We haven't been separated from God or we would be dead. Yeah, that's true. It's only God that supports all our metabolic processes, all the enzymes, exactly. All, the, exactly. all the cells, all the structures, everything. So what this means is we should have that same kind of terrible feeling when we sin. The separation of God. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and read that? Yeah. Satan, with his fierce temptation, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt again for a moment. I, I question whether we should interrupt the sequence that, the, that they are doing here, because if you go over to the chapter in Desire of Ages Tall, it is finished. It says at the very end of his life, just before he died, he thought, okay, I know my father. Even if I die, it's going to be all right. It's good. He's going to work it out. So he died a victor. And he, how did he die a victor? Even though he couldn't feel his father's presence, he still says, I know my father. Yes. And that was what gave him victory. He was free. The truth set him free. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, he feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be eternal. Christ felt the anguish, anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy is no longer... Shall no longer. I'm sorry? And mercy shall no longer. And mercy, when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So that's a question. Yeah, yeah. When people die, believers, 
Mm -hmm. They die sinners. Mm -hmm. So why don't they feel this separation as they are dying? Because they are sinners. They have asked for forgiveness, probably, yeah. but they are sinners and they're dying sinners. Yes, well, the point is that we should feel that every time we sin. It's not, it's not just when we're dying, we should feel this every time we're, because when we sin, we're actually placing a barrier between us and God. And Jesus felt that. And that's, that was my question earlier. I didn't, sure didn't know how to word it properly, but he felt that separation because he was not used to having any kind of separation there. He, he was in constant communion with his father. And it's sad that we still have wrath of God in many translations when mm -hmm. Amen. Maxwell used to say, it's just yeah. get the giving up yeah. of a person. But people hear the wrath and they hear yeah. an angry God. That's yeah. ter it's a terrible translation. You know, and, yeah. and, and it's so sad that many versions still have. Yeah, it's, it's okay if you read, if you know what to read into wrath. Yeah. But, but if you don't know what to read in wrath, it's, it's an angry God. And, yeah. and people are, are not educated. They just read it on and, you know, they did something religious, something that Mm -hmm. Might irritate and him for a little while. And that puts them into hell being an everlasting burning yeah. forever because that's the kind of God they think God is. Well, they don't yeah. believe in Genesis chapter 1, verse mm -hmm. 2, or and 3. They, they, they sub subscribe to Satan's uh, <laughs> message there in chapter well, In his three. dying moments, Jesus cried out the prophetic message from Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So, Jennifer, I think you're next. From Mark 15, verses 33 to 36. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness, which lasted for three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt. For, we're going to talk about what that means in just a moment. But Ellen White says that the black the, the blackness was so dark that you could not see your hands in front of your face. And I I try to imagine the Sanhedrin people are out there making sure that Jesus dies on the cross and all of a sudden So it's more sun than just more so than just clouds covering the sun. No, this is not. It's like you're being in a cave. Yeah. Where you, or even uh, you know, I've been in caves where you they take put your hand they turn yeah. out the lights. Yeah. And they put your hand in front of you and you can't That's see right. anything. Yeah. Hey, yeah, exactly. Okay, go ahead. Some of the people there heard him and said, "Listen, he is calling for Elijah." One of them ran up with a sponge, soaked it in cheap wine, and put it on the end of the end of a stick. Then he held it up to Jesus' lips and said, Wait, let us see if Elijah is coming to bring him down from the cross, from the Good News Bible. Okay, and Bible study guide then goes on. Jesus' words from the cross are reported in Aramaic along with the translation. The words, my God, my God, are Eloi, Eloi. In the verse, a transliteration of the Aramaic, Elahi. It would be easy to hear Jesus as uh, to hear Jesus is calling for Elijah, the Aramaic Eliyah, so you can see it's almost the same, which means my God is Yahweh. This is a mistake that some bystanders make uh, from our Bible study guide. So why was there darkness at the cross? Was it to shield Jesus from gawking humans who did not understand what was happening in the controversy between God and Satan over the character and government of God? I mean, clearly, Obviously, God was trying to make a point because he's going to end up tearing the, in the curtain top to from top to bottom in, in the temple. And this darkness was, I mean, they must have thought, okay, <laughs> there's something not normal going on here. Okay, Jim. The Gospel of Mark presents the cross as a very dark place, both physically and spiritually. A supernatural darkness descended on Calvary from about noon on that Friday after Friday until about 3 p.m. And when that sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour, Mark 15, verse 33 from the ESV. And then Jesus died, separated from the Father. Mark 15, 37, with a loud cry, Jesus died. Now, We've already said, and, and again, Ellen White says that just as he was dying, uh, 
I don't know, this was a spotlight of some kind or whatever, but a bright light just shone right on the cross and he shouted these words. They well, had to know, I mean, the people, this is not normal. Yeah. Every day living, I mean, you, you have, <laughs> yeah. you have something believe, supernatural. Yes, yeah, something was going on. <clears throat> I mean, you know, we could control some things, but yeah, you they can't control those things. <laughs> yeah. So what was the real cause of the death of Jesus? God had stated back in Genesis 2.17 that sin leads to death. It is our sins that separate us from God, the only source of life, Isaiah 4, 59, verse 2. Jesus came to demonstrate how that actually happens. The withdrawal of the divine countenance, as we read a moment ago, broke the heart of the Son of God. So God, instead of supporting the human Jesus, is now withdrawing himself. Ellen White described it as he withdrew his beams of light and love and so forth from Jesus. Jesus was treated as we deserve so that we could be treated as he deserved. Jesus died as a demonstration that the death, which is a direct result of sin, separated him from his father. That is what the Bible calls the second death, which will kill the wicked in the end. Jesus is the only person in the history of the universe so far who has died as a direct result of sin, the second death. We are given a choice. We can choose to live lives following the pattern of Jesus' life and live forever, or we can choose to ignore the messages he came to bring then and we will die the death that he died, separate from his or our father, the only source of life. And that's a very different picture than what is really presented. And one of the, one of the things that we would, it would be great if we had a long time to discuss it, but we humans have a hang up about the past. We want our sins from the past to be taken care of. And God says, it's history, it's permanent. It's in my memory. I'm not going to forget. You probably won't forget. Your guardian angel does to forget. Set that aside. I won't talk about it anymore if you don't. Let's talk about how to change the future. So let's see some change. That's what God is looking for. Well, God is referred to in Scripture as the... Re I'm sorry. This separation from God is referred to in Scripture, uh, Larry, as the wrath of God. See Romans 1, 18 to 32, 4, 25, and Matthew 27, 46. Was God's wrath displayed at the cross? See the handout about God's wrath on theox.org. And if you have this handout on your computer, you can click on that and you'll see a whole long discussion, biblical discussion about the wrath of God. Well, does the death of Jesus teach substitution? And the Bible study guide, the Bible study guide says this. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, look at how central the theology of substitution was to Ellen G. White and also to the Bible. Why is any theology that downplays the central role of substitution in Christ dying in our stead, paying in himself the penalty for our sins? A false theology? Okay, so... Is it true that that's a false theology? It's what not true that that's a false theology. Yeah. What is that? Uh, say that again. They're trying to say that substitution is the key. Yeah. That's it what the Sabbath good. It's not... Jesus died, didn't that, die a separate... Okay, separate that's right. That's, what the, no. Sabbath, that's oh. what the Bible study guide says, but yeah. I don't believe that. I don't either. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now let's look at this. Let's think about this carefully. It is true that because Jesus died to teach us the truth about sin and its results, if we take advantage of that experience and we learn the truth, then we do not have to die. In that sense, there's a kind of a substitution. But there's no such thing as transferring our sins to Jesus. Sins cannot be transferred. I mean, can we, living in 2024, sin and then, you know, I'll transfer my sins to Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago? It is true that the suffering that we should all experience was experienced by Jesus, so that if we learn the truth, we do not have to experience it. Again, I guess sort of in a casual kind of a way, that's a substitution. The idea that because of our sin, Jesus had to pay 
to the Father, the penalty we deserve because the Father has demanded that penalty be paid is not taught anywhere in the Bible. That idea has entered Christian thinking from pagan sources. And we have some evidence for that. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, read the correct way. Lorna? But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while, we thought that his suffering was punishment sent from God. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. Good News Bible. Now, you can, you can see how that's normally read. What they overlook is that part there, we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Yeah, yeah, it's good that it's... We were mistaken, but yeah. nobody will admit that they made a mistake. And Bible translations are full of that kind of <laughs> yeah. garbage. So what was the Roman officer talking about when he said that Jesus was the Son of God? When you say Son of God in Aramaic or Hebrew, what does that mean? You're also God. Yeah. You, you are a divine being. Did he have some understanding of the Jewish religion and the truth about Jesus, or was he just thinking in, in terms of Roman polytheism? Gordon? Roman, pardon me, Mark 15, 39. The army officer who was standing there in front of the cross saw how Jesus died. Quote, this man was really the son of God, he said, from the Good News Bible. Okay, what's your opinion? Did he understand what was going on there, or? No. Does he was just saying, well, he must be one of those gods. He, he can't be, this is not just normal, so must must be some supernatural thing. Probably. I think he said that something was out of the ordinary. Yeah, uh, for sure. Unnatural, so for I think sure of that. he recognized that part. Yeah, yeah. It is of note that virtually none of the disciples are mentioned in any of this sequence at the cross. Where were they? In the upper room with the door locked. Yes. <laughs> Why do you think it was that women felt so free to be around at the time of the crucifixion and also at the time of the resurrection? I mean, they were followers of Jesus. The disciples were in hiding. Notice that three women are specifically mentioned. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. After being at the cross till the end, we, were, we will note also that these women were back on Sunday morning very early, bringing spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Mark 15, 40 and 41. Some women were there at the cross, looking on from a distance. So they weren't right there, I mean. Yeah. They were back a little ways. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger James and of Joseph and Salome. They had followed Jesus where he had, while he was in um, Galilee and had helped him. Many other women who had come to, Ju to Jerusalem with him were there also. Good news. Now we remember what it says in Luke 8 verses 1 to 3. These women were supporting Jesus and the disciples with their money. I don't know, probably preparing meals and all yeah, kinds of stuff. Probably feeding them, yeah. Yeah. Okay, John 19. John 19, verses 25 to 27. Standing close to Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved, John, standing there. So he said to his mother, he is your son. Then he said to the disciple, she is your mother. From that time, the disciple took her to live in his home from the Good News Bible. Yeah, and she moved to Ephesus with him and she died in Ephesus. Um, if you stop and think about it, there's been a big discussion about Jesus' brothers and sisters. It talks about brothers and sisters. Uh, James and, and, and Jude, we know about, were his brothers, but others. And the question is, why aren't they taking care of his mother? Well, she wasn't their mother. They were children of a former wife of Joseph, and they were older than Jesus. So she was a stepmother. She was a stepmother, of yeah. James and... Yeah. Where was Joseph? Joseph was dead yeah. by this time. These women became important witnesses to the fact that Jesus was dead and buried and then rose back to life. 
At Jesus' death, it is interesting to note that the sacrificial system, which was so important to the Jewish leaders, was brought to an end as the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Mark 15, 37 and 38. And we we'll read that at the time of Jesus' death, the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Bible study guide, Jim. How ironic that when Jesus was dying on the cross, the priests in their uncontrolled excitement declared that the one on the cross was Christ, the King of the Jews, as King of Israel. Mocking, of course. Yeah. Even though Jesus is referred to as King many times in this chapter, it is Pilate who enunciates it most clearly. But now, even the leaders of the Israelite nation declares Jesus as Messiah and King of Israel albeit in mockery. They do, not, they do not know that, with Jesus' death, the necessity for their administration of sacrifices in the earthly sanctuary was about to cease. Mark 15, 37 says, Jesus let out a loud cry and died. And in the following verse, the gospel notes that the veils of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom. Mark 18, 30, excuse me, 15 to 38. And um, how do they in the ASB? That? Yeah, there's no way. This was a very, very heavy, ta heavy tapestry. I mean, he, and, and, and the ceremony was going on. If Ellen White says the priest was there trying to sacrifice a lamb, and they could look right in there, and all of a sudden, everybody's watching and rip. You know, thousands of people are watching. I kind of understood that that was between the most holy and the holy. I think so, so how would people be, because there was another section yeah. in front of that. So it seems like Presumably the, people, must have been, the general people wouldn't be seeing that. Just the priests would see that tear. Well, it sounds like, from reading what Ellen White says, it sounds like that they could see all the way in. So I don't know whether both, curtains, uh, both uh, curtains were torn or... I, I have had that question yeah. many times, I wondered. So how could so many people see yeah. it? There was no ark in there anyway, so yeah. what was kind of what they had there filling the chamber. One historical detail of extreme importance is the verification of the death of Jesus, since there are some who have claimed that Jesus did not die. Some say that he merely fainted or swooned on the cross. A soldier pierced his body with a spear, according to John 19, 32. And again, Ellen White says, if he hadn't been dead before that, that would have killed him immediately. But anyway, these are the words. Larry? Pilate, this is from Mark 15, 44 to 45. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. He called the army officer and asked him if Jesus had been dead a long time. After hearing the officer's report, Pilate told Joseph that he could have the body. And okay. I think this is because they were on the cross for days. Yeah. And exactly. here was like three Normally. hours. Yeah. And what was Pilate thinking when it was so dark that he yeah. couldn't see in the middle of the afternoon? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think it was tradition that people lasted for days. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Who dealt with the body of Jesus after he died? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, previously undeclared followers of Jesus, claimed his body. More irony. They're members of the Sanhedrin. It's here while their buddies are <laughs> arresting and trying and crucifying, Je arranging for crucifixion of Jesus. Yeah. They're his friends. Okay. Lorna, I think that's yours. It what? was towards evening when Joseph of Arimathea arrived. He was a respected member of the council who was waiting for the coming of the kingdom of God. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So Joseph went boldly into the presence of Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Okay, Gordon. And from the Bible study guide, it says, Mark 15, 43 tells of Joseph's request for the body of Jesus. But Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus already was dead, as noted in Mark 15, 44. He therefore summoned the centurion in charge of the crucifixion and asked if Jesus was dead already. The centurion confirmed that it was so, from the Bible study guide for Thursday. Okay, so that from go ahead. the Bible study yeah. guide, uh, also from Thursday, it says, 
In this passage, Joseph of Arimathea appears for the first and last time in the Gospel of Mark. He was a respected member of the Sanhedrin and one of the urban elites. As a wealthy and respected man, he had standing with the governor, which explains how he could dare approach Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. It is a touching detail that a member of the council took such interest in Jesus' burial. Meanwhile, where were Jesus' trusted disciples in all of this? Wow, hiding. I mean, and here we have, I mean, think about it, we have a split council. Most of the members of the council are voting 100% crucify him, crucifying, and here are two members of the same council said, we believe he's the Messiah. And we're therefore going to be here. We're going to go up there with our own hands, take him down from the cross and bury him. You wonder how they did that because these were big nails. Yeah. And so how do you remove a nail that's in it, solid wood? I, they, must have, the, they must have had the soldiers help them. Yeah, there must be some tool to take out the nail, take the body down from a yeah. cross once he's yeah. down. It seems like that's a, you know, I, 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 yeah. I would imagine these nails were sturdy going through the wrist. Yeah. And to take it out, you can't just pull it out, out exactly. of solid wood. Or divine intervention. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Three men helped to bury the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and John. Where did he come from? Okay. Um, John 19, verses 38 to 42. After this, Joseph who was from the town of Arimathea, asked Pilate if he could take Jesus' body. Joseph was a follower of Jesus, but in secret because he was afraid of the Jewish authorities. Pilate told him he could have the body. It's interesting, I'm sorry, I have to, smi to smile there. He was afraid of the Jewish authorities. He was one of them. <laughs> yeah. Pilate told him he could have the body, so Joseph went and took it away. Nicodemus, who at first had gone to see Jesus at night, went with Joseph, taking with him about 30 kilograms of spices, a mixture of myrrh and aloes. The two men took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen with the spices according to the Jewish custom of preparing a body for burial. There was a garden in the place where Jesus had been put to death, and in it there was a new tomb where no one had ever been buried. Since it was the day before the Sabbath, and because the tomb was close by, they placed Jesus' body there from the good And of course, we know from other sources that this was the burial place that Joseph of Arimathea had prepared for him and his family. For his own. Yeah. Well, Ellen White goes on, In this emergency, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to the help of the disciples. Both these men were members of the Sanhedrin. Again, the split council here and were acquainted with Pilate. Both of them were men of wealth and influence. They were determined that the body of Jesus should have an honorable burial. Joseph went boldly to Pilate and begged from him the body of Jesus. For the first time, Pilate learned that Jesus was really dead. Conflicting reports had reached him in regard to the events attending the crucifixion. Like, Lorna, like you said, the dark, like, what's going on, you know? It's not natural. Yeah. But the knowledge of Christ's death had been purposely kept from him. Pilate had been warned by the priests and rulers against deception by Christ's disciples in regard to his body. Upon hearing Joseph's request that he therefore sent for the centurion who had charged at the cross and learned for a certainty of the death of Jesus, he also knew, drew from him an account of the scenes of Calvary confirming the testimony of Joseph. So, it's interesting that all the steps, and we're going to see this more even going on to the final, final lesson, all the steps they tried to put in place to make sure that Jesus couldn't, the disciples couldn't steal his body, etc., etc., are just more and more proof that it was a real resurrection and he was really God. The request of Joseph was granted while John was troubled about, about the burial of his master. Joseph returned with Pilate's order for the body of Jesus. He, <laughs> no messing around, don't waste any time. I got the order. Joseph um, and Nicodemus came bringing a costly myrrh, uh, mixture of myrrh and aloes of about a hundred pounds weight for his embalming. Wow. The most honored in all Jerusalem could not have been shown more respect in death. 
the disciples were astonished to see these wealthy rulers and much, as much interested as they themselves in the burial of their Lord. Neither Joseph nor Nicodemus had openly accepted the Savior while he was living. They knew that such a step would exclude them from the Sanhedrin, and they hoped to protect him by their influence in his councils. For a time, they had seemed to succeed, but the wily priests, sensing their favor to Christ, had thwarted their plans. In their absence, Jesus had been condemned and delivered to be crucified. So if you don't like what your friends say, think and so forth, you just leave them out. Now that he was dead, they no longer concealed their attachment to him while the disciples feared to show themselves openly as his followers. Joseph and Nicodemus came boldly to their, uh, uh, their aid. The help of the, these rich men, honored men, was greatly needed at this time. They could do for their dead master what it was impossible for the poor disciples to do, and their wealth and influence protected them in a great measure from the mouths of the priests and rulers. Gently and reverently they moved, removed with their own hands the body of Jesus from the cross. Their tears, their sympathy fell fast as they looked upon his bruised and lacerated form. Joseph owned a new term, tomb hewn in rock. This he was reserved, reserving for himself, but it was near Calvary and he now prepared it for Jesus. The body, together with the spices brought by Nicodemus, was carefully wrapped in a linen sheet. The Redeemer was born to the tomb. There the three disciples, now they're all called disciples, straightened the mangled limbs and folded the bruised hands upon the pulseless breast. I'm going to drop down here. The women who were last at the cross and last at the tomb of Jesus. While the evening shades were gathering, Mary Magdalene and the other Marys um, lingered at the resting place of their Lord, shedding tears of sorrow over the fate of him whom they loved, and they returned the rest of the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Well, Mark 15 concludes with the actions of the Jewish leaders. A man of the Jewish leader of this Jewish leader, a man who found in Jesus the King of his life and of all his possessions. Joseph of Arimathea assumed all responsibility and expenses for Jesus' burial. When most of the disciples were far away and the nation had rejected the kingdom of God, there was one man, Joseph of Arimathea, who recognized that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So, disciples hidden away in the upper room, the locked doors two men from the Sanhedrin to come out to counteract the effect of all the other members of the Sanhedrin, and Jesus is buried. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what an intensive and incredible story. Someday, perhaps, we'll see in that panorama something about what was going through all these different people's minds to try to understand it more clearly. But Lord, help us not to be in any doubt about exactly what happened here and why it happened, and to live the kind of lives that will let us one day be a part of your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.